from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me tonight to the third chapter of John's Gospel. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night, probably afraid of criticism, or he had a desire for a private conversation, or maybe he wanted to give some more thought before committing himself to Jesus Christ. In any event, he came, and he asked Jesus some questions about spiritual life, and Jesus looked him up and down, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. In fact, he said, verily, verily, and any time that Jesus uses that expression, that means that what is going to follow is very important. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must, you have to be born again if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. Two years ago when we were touring Poland, while we were there, we met a priest, a Monsignor, who is head of one of the largest theological seminaries in the world. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I got my Ph.D. degree at the University of Chicago. And one day I was riding in a bus and sitting behind me was a black woman. And she punched me on the shoulder and she said, Sir, I beg your pardon, but have you ever been born again? And he said, Well, I suppose I have. He said, I'm a, I'm a priest. She said, That's not the question I ask you, sir. I ask you, had you been born again? And he said, Well, I, 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 uh, she said, have you been born again? And he said he went back to his rooms at the, at the university and got his Bible down and turned to the third chapter of John and reread this passage. And this passage spoke to him, and he said he got on his knees and he had an experience with Christ that he's never been able to get away from. Now, he said my theology would tell me that I was probably born again at a different period but he said, something happened, you can call it anything you want to, commitment, recommitment, conversion, whatever, something happened to me. Now, the question I want to ask you tonight is, has that ever happened to you? Give it some other title, some other name, if you want. Call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it faith, call it whatever. Has it ever happened to you? Many of you have thought a long time about religion and Christianity. Are you committed? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? Jesus said, you must be born again. Start with your hearts. Be born from above. You can be changed. The world could be changed. The country can be changed. A state can be changed. A family can be changed. A person can be changed. You can be changed. Now, Nicodemus must have been stunned when Jesus said that to him because if Christ had said that to Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, and they didn't like tax collectors then much more than they do now. But to say it to Nicodemus, one of the great religious leaders of his time, Nicodemus, it says, was a ruler. That meant that he was rich, he was religious, and yet he was searching for reality. How many of you go to church, but you're still searching? There's still an empty place in your heart, and something tells you inside that you're not really right with God. You see, Nicodemus fasted two days a week. Do you know anybody in your church that does that? He spent two hours every day in prayer. How many people do you know that spend two hours every day in prayer? He tithed all his income. Not many people even do that these days. He was a professor at the theological school of theology, and he worked hard at religion. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again born from above. Now, why did Jesus say that to Nicodemus? Because he could read the heart of Nicodemus. He saw what was in him. He saw that he had covered himself with religion, but he had not yet found the real thing, fellowship with God. What causes all of our troubles in the world, lying and cheating and hate and prejudice and social inequality and ultimately war? Jesus said, these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. He said, it's in our heart. He said, our hearts need to be changed. Psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists all recognize there's something wrong with man. There are many words in Scripture to describe it. There, I'll take only three words. 
One is called a transgression. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. What law? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one of those commandments? Then you're guilty of all. It's also the breaking of the law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience at any time? Sure you have. And if you go against your conscience very long, your conscience becomes dull and duller and duller until after a while it's a seared conscience and a dead conscience. And your conscience is no longer a safe guide to go by. It leads you astray because you've gone against it so much. And then there's another one, a commandment, law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Have you always done that? No. Then you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of being born again. And then another word carries with it the idea of missing the mark or coming short of your duty and a failure to do what you ought to do. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And yet before you can get to heaven, you must, you must have righteousness. God says be perfect as I'm perfect, holy as I'm holy. Where are you going to get that perfection? You don't have it now. Where are you going to get that holiness? You don't have it now. But you can't get to heaven if you don't. That's why Christ died on the cross. He died on the cross and shed his blood to provide the righteousness for you so that he provides you with the right kind of clothing to go to heaven. And the clothes that you must have are called the clothes of righteousness. And that was provided for you by Christ. And then there's another word, iniquity, a turning aside from the straight path. Isaiah said, we are like sheep. We've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Now, here in Idaho, I know that I think this is a sheep state, maybe the sheep state in the United States. I haven't seen any goats around yet. And maybe you have goats too. In New Zealand, they cross the sheep and the goats and they call them jeeps. That's a fact. And uh, when we were in New Zealand, I couldn't get over the fact of, of what they were doing. I don't know whether that improves them or destroys them. I don't know. But some of you don't know whether you're a sheep or a goat. Now, you see, Jesus said at the judgment, there's going to be the goats on this side and the sheep on this side. And the sheep are going to enter into the kingdom of God. Of course, there he's talking about the judgment of the nations, but it could be applied to individuals. Or it could be that you're a goat, and the goats are going to be cast into outer darkness, the Bible says. But one thing, you're not spiritually. You're not a jeep. You can't be both. You have to choose which one. And if you would like to make that choice watching by television, pick up that telephone and call that number that you see on the screen right now, and a counselor is standing by to talk to you and to help you find Christ as your Lord and Master, help you with your spiritual problems. They're all over the country. So call right now. And if it's busy, call again. They'll be there all evening. If the lines are tied up, keep calling. Don't give up. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Thus a radical change is needed by every person. We need those sins forgiven. We need to be clothed in the righteousness of God for the purpose of finding fulfillment in this life finding something to commit yourself to. What are you committed to? Are you a committed person? Do you really believe in a cause? Do you really believe in a person that symbolizes that cause? Why don't you make your cause Christ and follow him? He'll never let you down. And then not only to find complete fulfillment in this life, but also to be acceptable with God to be acceptable by God. Now, some of you would ask the question, what is the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? You see, Nicodemus, like you and me, he wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand it. Now, I used an illustration years ago.
that I couldn't understand because I was born and reared on a dairy farm. And I still wake up at night with nightmares doing this way. <laughs> because I had to get up every morning during high school at 3 o'clock and milk 20 cows. And then when I came home from school, I had to milk those same 20 in the afternoon. My father had a small dairy, had about 60 cows that we milked, and then we would sell the milk door to door, have a little dairy truck that took the milk early in the morning. And that's all I remember almost as I was a boy because we worked hard on that dairy farm. But how can a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter? I don't understand that. Well, I'll tell you what, because I don't understand it, I'm never going to drink milk again. I've got to understand that before I can drink milk. I almost quit milk when the cow stepped in the bucket and it just kept on milking. I don't understand color television. Do you know that I am so old that I can remember when there was no television? Now, I tell that to one of my grandchildren, they look at me as though I came out of the ark. <laughs> I can remember when there were, we didn't have any radio. In fact, I remember the first station that came on there was KDKA in Pittsburgh, and my dad had an old crystal set, and he said, I think we've got it, and got earphones, and we'd all stand around to try to listen. The only station on there in the United States. That's how old I am. Well, you can't imagine a world without paved highways. You ought to have seen the two ruts in front of our house that went clear to town. There were only two paved streets in our whole town. Well, suppose I would say, because I don't understand television, how somebody can be in Rome or New York or Jerusalem or someplace like that, and I can see him instantaneously on my set. I don't understand it. I'm not going to watch it. And I push the button to turn it off. I've got to understand it first. Why, well, you'd say you're crazy. Well, of course, I don't understand these computers. I don't understand all these things that they're developing. This whole scientific age has passed me by. We didn't study that in the school I went to. But I accept it by faith. You see, Nicodemus could see only the physical and the materialistic. And Jesus was talking about the spiritual. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when he said that, he did not mean that you can inherit it. You cannot inherit it. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your father and mother can be the greatest born-again Christians in the world, but that doesn't make you a born-again Christian. I can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make me a motor car. <laughs> and there are many people that have the idea that because they are born in a Christian home that they're automatically Christians. Well, you're not. And you cannot work your way alone, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then reformation is not enough. You can reform and say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to have New Year's resolutions and all the rest of it. Isaiah said, all our righteousness is filthy rags and rags in the sight of God. If you take a pig and take him into your living room and into the bathroom, give him a good bath, wash him down with some Chanel number no. five, put a ribbon around his neck, bring him in the living room. You say, now I've got a new pig. He's, he's turned into a perfect gentleman. Look at him sitting over there. You open the door, let the pig out and see where he goes. His heart hasn't been changed. Only the outside had been changed. And that's the way with some of us. We've been changed some on the outside to conform to certain social standards or certain things that are expected of us in our churches. And yet down inside, we've never been changed. Now that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He said, Nicodemus, you need changing inside. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. You must be born from above. That's a supernatural act of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, disturbs you about the fact that you've sinned against God. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit regenerates you. That's when you're born again.
And then the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, to help you in your daily life. You don't leave here alone without any help. The Spirit of God goes with you from now on to give you assurance, to give you joy, and to produce fruit in your life, and to teach you the Scriptures. You can't reform. That's not enough. And you can't imitate. You try to imitate Christ. They used to have, a, there was a book Sheldon wrote called In His Steps, and people thought that all you had to do is try to follow Jesus and try to do the things He did, and you'd get to heaven. You can't do it. We can't live up to the Sermon on the Mount. You try living up to the Sermon on the Mount, literally. You can't do it. You don't have that kind of spiritual strength. I told a story that happened many years ago from a couple in Oklahoma. And they had read about this play in New York called My Fair Lady. And they told everybody they were going to New York and they were going to see My Fair Lady. What they didn't know is that it was sold out four or five months in advance. When they got there, they couldn't buy any tickets. So they said, what are we going to do? Our friends all back home will think we saw My Fair Lady. We're going to be embarrassed. So they hit upon a good idea. They went over and they bought one of the books that you could buy for a dollar that told all about the play. And then they saw people, they waited till people started coming out of the theater and they saw some of them throwing their tickets aside that had been cut in half. And so they went over and picked up some tickets. Then they began to hum and sing. I could have danced all night or on the street where she lives, or one of those tunes in My Fair Lady. And when they got home, they were humming the tune. They had the book that told about it, and they had the tickets. And everybody thought they'd been to see My Fair Lady. And that's the way you are. You know the religious language. You can sing the songs. You can even pray the prayers. The only thing is you haven't been to the foot of the cross and been born again. That's the message Jesus was trying to get over to this religious leader. Now, to be born again means, in Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. In Romans, Paul speaks of it as being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it being a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In Peter, Peter says partakers of a divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change in the whole philosophy and manner of living. Now, how is it accomplished? What happens? Well, there's a mystery. Jesus said the wind blows where it listeth, and you cannot tell from whence it cometh or where it goeth. You can see the result. Now, the other day, I did not see, when we had that terrible storm a couple days ago, I did not see the wind, did you? I saw the effects of it. I saw limbs flying by, parts of a roof torn off flying by, the dust going by, the willow trees bending over. I saw the results of the wind, but I never actually saw the wind, and neither did you. You see, the wind blows where it listeth, Jesus said. There's a mystery to it. And the analogy of natural birth, I think, applies here. You see, natural birth is the moment of conception. Then there's the nine months of gestation. And then there's actual birth. Now, you may be in one of those stages tonight. This may be the moment of conception for you. It may be another stage of gestation. Or it may be actual birth. Only the Holy Spirit could answer that question. That's the mystery of it. There is a mystery that I cannot explain to you. And Jesus did not attempt to explain it to Nicodemus. You see, that's why we're to come by faith to Christ. We can never understand it. Our little finite minds cannot understand the infinite. Our finite minds cannot understand the mighty God. We come by simple childlike faith and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you are born again. But it happens this way. First, there has to be the reception of the Word of God. And I believe that is conception. 
1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in Romans 10, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now tonight you are hearing and you're hearing the word of God and that's the first step. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching or declaration or proclamation to save them that believe. It sounds foolish that men can stand up and use words out of a Bible and that has power to penetrate your heart and change your life. But it does because it's God's holy word. This is not an ordinary book. This is a living book, a living word. And then there's the work of the Holy Spirit, as I've already explained. He convicts. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then he indwells. He changes us. He changes our wills, our affections, our objectives for living, our disposition. He gives us a new purpose and new goals. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. And then he indwells. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Does God the Holy Spirit live in you? If there's a doubt about it, pick up that telephone if you're watching by television and call that number. And a counselor will be there to help you to make sure that you have been born again. You remember the story in the Bible of Naaman? Naaman was the general commander in chief of all the armies of Syria, and Syria is much in the news these days. He was commander in chief. He had everything. The king had honored him. But he was a leper. And he knew that in a short time he was going to be thrown out of the military and he was going to be just a, a person going around with a little bell saying, keep away, keep away, keep away. I'm a leper, I'm a leper, I'm a leper. And he heard a little slave girl from Israel tell about a wonderful man that could heal him over in Israel. And he went to his king and the king said, if anybody in Israel can heal you, please go. And he went, and when he finally came to this man after a number of experiences, the prophet said, go to the Jordan and dip seven times, and on the seventh time you will be healed. He told the servant to tell him that, in fact, the prophet didn't even come out to see the general. The general was there in all of his uniform and all of his men, and the prophet just stayed back in the kitchen somewhere, didn't even come out and greet him, just sent word to him. And the general turned away in disgust. But one of his captains said to him, or one of his aides said, Sir, if he had told you a hard thing, you'd have done it. He said, Go to the Jordan. He said, Yeah, but the Jordan River is muddy and our rivers are clear. That Jordan River can't do anything. He said, But why don't you try, sir? You're a leper. You've got to do something. So the general went to the Jordan River, and he dipped himself four or five times and he said, see, the leprosy is still there. It doesn't do any good. But sir, he said seven times. So Naaman went down for the seventh time and when he came up, his skin was clean and whole. The thing that had saved him was the fact that he did what the prophet had told him. The greatest prophet of them all is Jesus Christ. And he says, you must be born again. How do you become born again? Repenting of sin, that means you're willing to change your way of living and you'll say to God, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Simple, childlike. And then by faith, receive him as your Lord and Master and Savior. And then be willing to follow him in a new life of obedience in which the Holy Spirit helps you as you read the Bible and pray and witness. If there's a doubt in your mind that you have been born again, I hope you'll settle it before you leave here tonight because the Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says he that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. You just can't come to God any time you want to. You can only come when the Holy Spirit is drawing and he's speaking to you tonight in answer to the prayers of thousands of people in Idaho and throughout the country. Come to Christ tonight. Why do I ask people to come publicly? We've seen several thousand people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I ask you to come publicly because Jesus said, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. 
He hung publicly for you on the cross. Certainly you can come in front of this audience in this beautiful stadium and receive him into your heart. I'm going to ask you to do that right now. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you, but I'm going to ask you to come and stand here in front of the platform. And this is a symbolic act of an inward decision that you're making. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, then you can go back and join your friends. God bless you. It's wonderful to know that tonight can be a night of new beginning for you. You say, well, how? Take a moment to call that number on your screen or to write to Billy Graham tonight or this week and let him know about your desire and we'll send you some helps through the mails that will encourage you and help you make your decision for Jesus Christ. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559 or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. Toward the battle, into the darkness, anytime, anywhere. This is our mission, sharing hope. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, a wonderful story in the life of Jesus Christ. And just one verse of Scripture, and it's a very brief verse. It says, and he must needs go through Samaria. Jesus had been teaching. The scribes and the Pharisees had been listening. They had told him that John the Baptist had just been imprisoned and he taught as one having authority. And the people came to listen and he taught in great simplicity so that the common people heard him gladly. And now he has to go back to Galilee. He's down south in Judea. Now he's going to go to Galilee. He doesn't get on a plane. He doesn't get on a bus. He doesn't get in a car. He walks. And while it wasn't a very long distance by today's standards, in those days, that was a long distance to go from Judea up to Galilee. And he was going to Cana. But it says he must needs go through Samaria because, you see, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. They didn't like each other. They avoided each other. The Samaritans had intermarried. They were not pure-blooded. And then they had the Jewish people would always go on the eastern side or they'd go the western side of the Jordan River to avoid going through Samaria. But Jesus, it says, must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because Jesus had an appointment there that he was going to keep. That appointment had been made centuries earlier in the council halls of God that he must needs go through Samaria. You know, much of the Bible lands is desert. Water is extremely important. Wells are important. And in Samaria, at the foot of two mountains, 
was Jacob's well that Jacob had dug. There's not only water that you drink for your physical needs, but there's spiritual water. Jesus said, I am the water of life. Jeremiah said, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In a number of places, the Bible refers to people who have no spiritual water. Ye shall be as the garden that hath no water, says Isaiah, the first chapter. In Zechariah, it says, prisoners of the pit, wherein there's no water. Second Peter 2, 17, these are wells with no water, spiritual water. The scripture says in Isaiah, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. It says that the waters are like our own hearts. Our hearts are troubled and they never rest. I watch the waters, they never seem to rest. They're always moving and disturbed. And God says there's no peace to those who reject God. There's no peace to those who are not living for God. Now the scarcity of spiritual water throughout the world today is tremendous. People are hungry and thirsty. We read about it in our papers constantly. And people in this country are going to the wrong watering holes, searching for satisfaction, searching for something that only the water of life and the bread of life could meet. And that person is Jesus Christ, who is the water of life and the bread of life. You can go down our streets in the major cities of America and see our young people searching for something. They don't know what like that girl at Harvard University. She cried for several days and finally the psychiatrist said, I can do nothing with her. And so they called for the family to come and the father and mother came. And she finally blurted out to her father, Father, I want something, but I don't know what it is. And many people are like that. They're searching for something and they go to all kinds of things, whether it's drink or sex or whatever it is to try to find that answer. Maybe it's money or maybe it's power, whatever it is, but it doesn't really satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. Searching for something that will bring satisfaction and quench this terrible spiritual thirst that only God can satisfy. Water in the Middle East is very scarce and often hard to obtain. A man who owns a well of water is sometimes better off than if he owned a well of oil. Many wars have been fought over water. In our text today, Jesus has been teaching in Judea. He's going through Samaria. It's the shortest way, but it's not the way that the Jewish people of that day went because they had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus knew about the woman that he was going to see. He knew that he had an appointment with that woman. He wanted to teach his disciples a lesson in race relations or a lesson in how to win people to Christ. Jesus was weary. He sits down at Jacob's well. The disciples had gone to town to buy food. This woman came. It was almost noon. Women usually came in the evening when it was cooler. But this woman came alone in the middle of the day when it was very hot. But because of her character, she was probably a social outcast. She came with her water pot to get water. And Jesus asked her for a drink. That absolutely shook her because Samaritans and Jews didn't even talk to each other. And certainly no Jewish person would ask a Samaritan for a favor. In just that moment, Jesus was sweeping away 
many prejudices that people have, like race prejudice. One of the greatest needs we have in America is for the Lord to come into our hearts and take away our prejudice against other people who don't look like we do and who don't have the same color of skin that we have. It takes full-time prayer and saying, oh God, take this from my heart. And then there was national prejudice because of the Jews and the Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. We have today a crisis in nationalism in many parts of the world. It's rising. That's the reason many people are concerned about the situation in the world, because there are many dangerous areas in the world. And I was always thankful for the work that people like James Becker did to help bring peace to the world. But Jesus saw this woman sitting there on Jacob's well, and he said, would you give me a drink? And she was astonished at such tolerance and courtesy and kindness that she saw in his eyes. And she said, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with us Samaritans? He didn't want to force religion on her. He begins on another subject entirely. He's tactful. He's diplomatic. He asks for a favor. He puts himself under obligation to the woman. Jesus said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given the living water. God offers all of us a gift tonight. It's something you can't work for. It's something you can't buy. It's something you can't earn. It's a gift. It's free. It's spiritual water. It's forgiveness of all your sins because of the cross and the resurrection. Isaiah the prophet said in the 55th chapter, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and you that have no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? The prophet asked. And you labor for that which satisfieth not. The thing that you work so hard for and the thing that you desire so much and the thing that you go out to enjoy doesn't satisfy. This woman replied, she said, Sir, you don't have anything to draw with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water you're talking about? You see, she mistook the kind of water he was talking about. He was talking about living, eternal water. She went back to the well. She was talking about that water. Now, the Bible teaches that we are blind to the glories and the thrill of the love of God and the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 3.14 it says, But their minds were blinded. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There's a supernatural power that blinds you, spiritually blind. Physically, you have perfect eyesight, but spiritually, you're blind. You were blinded by an outside spiritual force called the devil. 1 Corinthians 2 says, But the natural man, that's you, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He offers you that water tonight. 
Is your soul, is your spirit, is your mind thirsty for something more in life that you haven't found? Oh yes, you may be baptized. You might have been confirmed in the church and you're a good person and you go to church. But deep inside your heart, something is lacking. There isn't the fulfillment and the satisfaction and the peace that you would like to have and that you believe God could give you. What should you do? Drink of the living water. Jesus provides the living water at the cross. He went to the cross. As Mrs. Baker so beautifully told us a moment ago, and there he was beaten and reviled. That wasn't his real suffering. His real suffering came when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible, awful, mysterious moment, God had laid on him the sins of the world. Your sins and my sins, everything I've ever done wrong was put on Jesus. He took the judgment and the hell that I deserve on that cross. Jesus was offering this woman water for her thirsty soul. Our souls are empty and lonely and guilty. She felt the emptiness of her own soul and she said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. She was very sincere, but sincerity alone is not enough. A few years ago in the Rose Bowl, a man picked up the football Everybody shouted. They were all to their feet because the score was tied, and he ran for a touchdown. But he'd gone the wrong way, and he scored for the other side. He was very sincere. You never saw a more sincere man as you watched him, but he was wrong. You can be sincere in your religion, but you can be wrong. There is a way, the Bible says, that seems right, but the end thereof is the way of judgment and death. You may be on the wrong road. God is asking you tonight to turn around toward the cross by faith. Repent of your sins and receive Him as your Lord and Master and make sure of it. There are hundreds of you here tonight that have religion, but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ. And you'd like to make sure before you leave here. You'd like to know that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. But you're not sure of it. You don't have that peace and that joy that you believe is there somewhere for you and you haven't found it. Come and take of this living water, which is Christ tonight. Now, the kingdom of God is not entered easily. Jesus said you have to go through a narrow gate and walk a narrow road and you may be misunderstood and even persecuted, and you may suffer for your faith. So Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Now he was hitting on a sore nerve. What a spot he touched in her life. He knew her sins. He knows yours. What an overwhelming flood of guilt and remorse this brought to her. She shrank back. It was as if a thousand searchlights had been turned on in her heart and every dirty secret in her life leaped into the glare. No person can come to Christ until there's conviction that you have sinned against God and you have repented. And repentance means to change your mind, change your direction, change your way of living. It means that you're willing to change. She partly covered it up and said, I have no husband. The scripture says, he that covered this sin shall not prosper. Jesus gently reminded her that technically she was right. She had no husband. She had had five husbands and the man she was now living with was not her husband. And she said two things. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And please, sir, would you give me 
this living water. I want it. I need it. I need it in my life. At that moment, she acted on the light that she had, which wasn't much. You don't have to know much when you come to Christ. You don't have to know the whole gospel. You don't have to know the Bible. You just come like you are. The thief on the cross didn't know very much, but he turned to Jesus while he was dying and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Just remember me. He had no time to join a church. He had no time to be baptized. He had no time for anything. He just said, Lord, remember me. And that's all that was needed because Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You and I are to worship God in spirit and in truth. Where you worship God is not the important thing. It's how you worship God. You worship him in prayer, in the reading of the Bible, in giving to the church, in going to church. We worship God and we adore him. And everything we do is an act of worship, if you know Christ. In all these ways, we worship God. Jesus made the greatest of all revelations to her when he said, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he has come, he's going to explain all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he. I am the Messiah. What a shock that was to her, that she was talking to the Messiah that the Samaritans and the Jews both were looking for and we're looking for today. At that moment, she was converted. At that moment, her name was written in the book of life. At that moment, she guaranteed, she was guaranteed a place in the kingdom of heaven. And from that moment on, she became a witness. She proved that she, was, had, that she had met Christ. She left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, she didn't say it to the ladies because they probably had nothing to do with her. The men knew her. So she said it to the men, come and see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ that we've been waiting for? And many Samaritans in that city believed. Here was the, a woman evangelist evangelizing among men, telling them about Jesus. She didn't have much theology to tell them. She didn't know what to say. All she said was, come and see Jesus and Jesus will change your life as he's changed mine. Have you been to Jesus that way? Have you come? Are you sure your sins are forgiven? Have you been to the cross and said, Lord, I have sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of life. And I come by faith. I don't understand it all, but by faith I receive you as my Lord and my Master and my Savior. We've seen hundreds of people each of these two nights that we've been here come. And I ask people to come and stand in front of the platform. And as they come, you're coming and saying, Lord, I'm coming to you. I want to make sure of my relationship with you. I want this living water. I want this living water in my own life and in my home. I want this living water in my work. I want this living water at all times. I'm thirsty. I need God. I need to make sure. I need to make certain. We never know when our moment is going to come, when we have to face God. I'm going to ask you to get up and come tonight and make sure of your relationship with Christ. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'm going to have a prayer with you say a word to you and give you some literature that you can take back to your home and study and read and it'll help you to grow. All over the stadium, from that top stadium up there, we've timed it. It takes about five or six minutes for you to come. Don't let distance keep you from Christ because you may never have a moment like this again. When will you ever have a moment in Pittsburgh like this again when you can come and make a commitment like this? Jesus said, 
If you are not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and settling it and sealing it in your life. We're going to, uh, Jesus died on the cross publicly for you. Now you can come publicly and say yes to him. You may be sitting down here. You may be up there. You may be up here in that middle section. Wherever you are, God is speaking to you. There's a little voice that says you ought to come to Christ. We're going to wait on you as you come.